Well, good morning, church. Hey, can you help me welcome everyone that's joining us online today and those that are uh, out our campus in the chapel video venue. We're so glad that you're here with us today. And if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Josh and I get to serve as your pastor here at our Broken Arrow campus. And before we dive in today, I want us to take just a moment to think back to last weekend because there is a lot to celebrate. Our Easter weekend here at Battle Creek Church uh, shattered just about every record that we've had. It was the largest Easter, not only here at Broken Arrow, but across all of our campuses. And uh, what's so exciting is the number of people who made decisions for Jesus, who were baptized last weekend. And I want to give a special shout out. There were literally hundreds of people, hundreds of you, who served with us for the very first time on Easter. And I'm just so grateful for you for making all of that possible. And uh, it really was an incredible Easter weekend. We've been praying for revival and we're believing that we're seeing God's uh, work in our midst with us. And, and so today, today I want to begin by asking you to think about what is your greatest need? What is your greatest need? What is in the windshield of your life, maybe that's keeping you from seeing what you truly need to see? In fact, maybe this last weekend you were here, you celebrated Easter with us, you celebrated the empty tomb, but then thought, well, is that it? Like, what now? With this greatest need, maybe you're, you feel like we celebrated this, this resurrected Jesus, but, but I still feel abandoned by my father. Maybe in marriage, you're still facing the, the, the navigating through the process of infertility. Maybe you still can't find a job or, or you're longing to be married. You're still wrestling with that addiction. You're saying, is this it? Like, what do you perceive to be your greatest need right now, today. Today, we're starting this brand new series through the Gospel of John. And the goal of this series really is to help you find answers. And not just any answer, but ultimately the answer. We want you to find the answer to your greatest need, to handling crisis, to the hopelessness that you may feel, inadequacy, uh, perhaps even suffering that you've experienced in your life. And specifically, we're going to look at the role that Jesus plays in answering those questions. And as we go through the Gospel of John together over the next several weeks, I'm convinced that we're going to see that Jesus' greatest concern is for our greatest need. In fact, not only do I believe that, I also believe that he provides the answer to your greatest need. And so if you have your Bible with you today, I want you to open to John chapter 2. John is where we're going to start. This is the New Testament. And John was one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, he writes this gospel when he's about 90 years old. And so this is you know, 70 years after the cross. And by this point, all of the disciples have died a martyr's death, all except for John. In fact, at this point, all of the letters, all of the books that we have in what we know as the Bible today have been written, all except for five and John would write these books in his old age. And John's gospel, if you've ever read through all four of the gospels, you know it is the most unique, and that's intentional. And part of the reason it's intentional is because there are different audiences. You know, the gospel of Matthew, the, the audience was the Jews. The gospel of Mark, the audience was the Romans. For Luke, it was the Greeks. And all three of those gospels are considered synoptic gospels because there's a sameness to them. But John's gospel was written to the church. In other words, we are the audience that he has in mind. And when we look at the contents of his gospel, it helps to connect us to the context for why he's actually writing this to begin with. You see, the church, the Christian church, was in the third generation at this point, and John had been there from the very beginning, from the very start, and false teaching about the person of Jesus Christ had begun to circulate around. Some were saying that that Jesus Christ was not God. Some were saying that he was just a created being like us. And so John opens his gospel with those famous words. He says, the word, meaning Jesus, he says, Jesus was with God and he was God. Jesus, God in the flesh, came to live among us, he says, among the disciples. He's declaring, he's saying, I saw him. I touched him. I was with him. And at the very end of the book, at the end of the gospel, we see his thesis statement in John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, these are written, everything that he writes is written so that you, so that you and I may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, 
the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. That's why John writes this gospel. He wants us to believe. He wants you and I to have life, but he doesn't just expect us to believe blindly. In fact, he aims to do this. He sets up his case by framing the gospel around seven miracles. And there's several Greek words for miracles that we find in Scripture. There's one for power, one for wonder, one for work. But John uses the Greek word simeon, which means sign. And the reason he uses this word is because he wants us to understand these seven miracles, they point to something. They direct our attention to something beyond the miracle in and of itself. And these signs, and ultimately the entire gospel of John, are meant to shift our focus. They're meant to remove the blind spots that we may have, to expand our vision. And the first sign, this first miracle, it's not what anyone would have expected. And yet, as we see, I believe it reveals the answer to our greatest need. In fact, I think we're going to see three different steps that we can take to find the answer that Jesus provides. And so let's jump in to this first miracle together. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now, what's interesting here. There is no mention of a first or a second day leading into this story. So what's the significance of John noting this on the third day? For believers, for followers of Jesus, what comes to mind when we hear on the third day? We think resurrection. We think Easter that we just celebrated. John is dropping this subtle note. He's saying from the very beginning that this sign, this miracle, it's pointing to something. It's a glimpse of what's to come. In fact, when we read through John's gospel, we need to keep in mind that John's account is history, but it is also theology. And there are so many theological implications and nuances throughout this account. I mean, just just think about what the location of this first miracle says to us. You only get one first impression. This sets the tone for Jesus' ministry. It it points to who Jesus is and what he's all about. And where's it at? It's at a party. Not just any party. In that day and age, this was the party. I mean, weddings were the pinnacle of social events in Jesus' day. I mean, have you ever thought about that according to John, who wrote not only this gospel, but also Revelation, that Jesus' ministry starts and culminates with a party. At the end of the story, The picture of heaven is this wedding banquet. The church is called the bride of Christ. And when the church is united with Christ in heaven, Revelation 19 says this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so the wedding in Cana, for John, this points to a wedding to come. Jesus says later in the gospel that he would prepare a place for us and that we're invited. We're on the guest guest list. This is good news for us today. Don't Don't miss the rich theology of this. Jesus likes a good party. Not just a worldly party. Don't hear what I'm not saying, but Jesus likes a good party. And we see in the next verse that not every party goes according to plan. Next verse in verse three. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. She comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, the open bar has been closed. (laughs) This is catastrophic. And I don't know if you've ever experienced a wedding catastrophe or not. You know, when Sarah and I got married, Sarah was very clear that cake in the face would be a a, a, a catastrophe for our wedding. She was very clear about that. And I'll just confess that when we're cutting that cake, I have never experienced a greater temptation in my life. (laughs) But I resisted. I, I was smart. I kept thinking, happy wife, happy life, happy wife, happy life. But, you know, the cake cutting moment is such a special moment, right? And so I can only imagine how this couple felt uh, when this was their experience. And and to be fair, every wedding cake I've ever tasted tastes terrible. And so this perhaps is just a blessing in disguise. But what's not a blessing on your wedding day is a concussion. (laughs) Apparently, the bride wanted to come in with some fancy entrance. And, uh, you know, I know married people say this all the time but I don't think she really remembers her wedding day. (laughs) I love this one that I found of this couple. And as you can see from his face, 
I think that this truly was his first love, right? <laughs> and if you think that's bad, imagine showing up to your wedding and seeing, yeah, I know farm barn weddings are really in right now. If you're planning one, just remember hay bales and candle centerpieces. Not a good idea to put them together. And, and I saw this photo and I thought, surely, like there cannot be anything more catastrophic on a wedding day, right? Now, we don't know if this was before or after the I do. Uh, it might change some things for this couple. But, but as catastrophic as, as these examples may be, running out of wine, we have to understand it was even more so. Uh, again, we have to understand the cultural context of what's going on. The wedding festivities in that day and age could last a week or even more for the Middle Eastern culture. And in the Middle Eastern culture, hospitality is everything. You see, to run out of wine when you're entertaining guests, especially those who may have traveled from far, it was a breach of hospitality that you could actually sue someone over. I can't imagine taking to someone to small claims court over a punch bowl. But the shame, we have to understand the shame that this family would experience in that culture would cast a shadow over this newlywed couple potentially for generations. It had the potential to ruin them socially and financially. And so we see this story isn't really about drinks. It's about a family's dignity. This is about their potential. It's about their future. And the need had implications that reached far beyond the cocktail hour. And, and perhaps that resonates with you today. Maybe you have a need that reaches far beyond just today. You have a financial need. And you're worried not just about how it impacts your life today, but how it may impact your life tomorrow. Maybe you're frustrated in your singleness today, but, but really you're fearful. Because with each passing year, you're starting to wonder, is this going to affect my ability to actually have a family in the future? Or maybe you're longing for purpose and for vision in your life, but really what you're concerned about is that your life at the end, you'll look back and go, I didn't do anything of significance. Whatever your need is, whatever the need that comes to mind, the first thing that we need to do is invite Jesus in. You need to invite Jesus in. And here's the reality. Jesus is already there. He's present in every need we will ever have. And so inviting him in is actually for our benefit. It makes us aware of his presence. Mary isn't just informing Jesus, she's involving him. She's inviting him in and asking him to be a part of the solution. Have you ever wondered why Mary would bring this to Jesus? Mary was likely involved in the wedding in some way, shape, or form if she knew that the wine was gone. And most scholars believe that at this point in her life that Mary would be a widow. And so that means that Jesus, as her firstborn son, would have been the one providing for her up until this point. And, and in that culture, family took care of family. I and mean, there was no 401k. There was no social security. Kids literally were the retirement plan. Which just as a side note, I think that's part of the reason why they would have so many. You know, I can imagine them looking at two-year-old Johnny, picking his nose, thinking our entire future, maybe we should try again. Just statistically play the odds. And, and, and you know, Mary, she, she, she goes to Jesus because she believes that he could help. And certainly at this point in her life, she would have experienced his resourcefulness. You know, we sing at Christmas, Mary, did you know, listen, she knew something. She had to have known something. But in addition to believing that Jesus could help, I think there's another possibility. And the text doesn't state this explicitly, but it is possible that Mary has mixed motives. Imagine the need that Mary has. Remember, she's approached by an angel during her engagement. She became pregnant with Jesus prior to her own marriage ceremony, which means she was denied her rightful place to be honored. The rumor had spread that Mary was an immoral, immoral woman. In fact, in John 9, we see that Jesus is even referred to as an illegitimate child. Think about her reputation. It's possible that Jesus, or that Mary rather, was trying to get Jesus to display his power to clear her own name. She may have thought, if they could just see his glory, then perhaps they'd believe my story. But Jesus responds to her in verse 4. He says, woman, 
why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Now, in our culture, this sounds incredibly cold and harsh, but woman here is not a term that's used disrespectfully. In fact, Jesus addresses his mother in the same way when he's on the cross in this very tender and sweet moment in John 19. He's not being offensive, but Jesus is making a point. Jesus is saying, I cannot be manipulated or coerced, not even by my own mother. He is making it clear that the start of his redemptive ministry, the start of his ministry would be up to his divine father, not his earthly mother. You see, all throughout the gospel, we see this. Jesus' sole purpose, his only priority is to do the will of the Father, to bring glory to God. Now, this doesn't mean that he doesn't care about his mother's requests. Jesus is concerned about our concerns. Jesus does care about the needs that we bring him, but his response to our concerns and to our needs always has a divine filter. He responds according to his ultimate purpose, which is to accomplish the work of the Father. And so in our need, first and foremost, we need to invite Jesus in. But not only do we need to invite Jesus in, ultimately, we need to do what he says. We need to do what Jesus tells us to do. I love how Mary responds in verse five, just like you'd expect a mom to respond. Jesus is telling her mom, my hour hasn't come yet. And, And just look at how she responds. She looks at the servants. She's like, just do whatever he tells you to do. Right? And this may be the most straightforward application that could be made. If you're looking for a rule of life, if you're looking for a guiding principle that supersedes all other principles, here it is. Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. In your need, do whatever he tells you to do. I've heard it said that if a man can predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off, you should just go with whatever they say. And Mary believes that Jesus will provide instruction, that he'll provide guidance in this situation. But notice, she doesn't tell the servants that Jesus is going to give them more wine. We know the end of the story. We know that's what happens. But Mary, in this moment, she is expressing faith. Faith that Jesus' answer to the problem, that his solution will be the best solution regardless of what his answer is. How often? Do we bring our needs and our concerns to Jesus with our own solution already attached? Right? Many times we bring our answers to Jesus and we say, Jesus, can we just get your stamp of approval on this? Like, I just believe that if if you would just do this in this way, that it would be the answer to this, which for the record is a great practice as an employee. I tell our team all the time, don't bring a problem without a solution. Right? Show initiative by being a problem solver, not just a problem bringer. But Jesus doesn't need us to bring him our solutions. Mary understood that Jesus' solution would be the best answer, even if the solution that Mary wanted was not what Jesus gave. That requires faith. See, faith in action is being willing to do whatever Jesus tells you to do. And so what did Jesus tell them to do? Well, we pick up in verse six. It says, the nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet and they did so. We see in this, these verses twice, complete and instant obedience. And Jesus said, fill the jars. And they didn't say how high. The servants filled them to the brim. Not partially, not most of the way, completely and fully. Now, to be fair, filling the jars with water doesn't require much faith. They were water jars. Right? And so it would make sense to fill them with water. And, and as servants, it was their job to do whatever was asked of them. But the second ask that Jesus makes to fill up a cup and serve it to the master, they had to think, say what? Is that sanitary? Like just, just to be clear, you want us to grab a drink from the jars that we use to wash our hands and our feet with and then serve it? That would have required a huge step of faith. This is now their livelihoods that are on the line. You may say, Josh, what's the point? Here's the point. Don't be alarmed when Jesus asks you to do something that doesn't make sense. There are so many things that do not make sense apart from the kingdom of God. I mean, you think about fasting. 
Jesus expects that his followers are going to periodically abstain from food for the sake of intentionally engaging in prayer and spiritual devotion. And many think, well, fasting, there's no way. I'd be tired, I'd be weak, I'd feel depleted. But for those of us who have fasted, we can speak to the fact that it enriches you. It fills us with spiritual power. When you think about tithing, God asks us to return to him the first 10% of our income. And many people just scoff at that and they think there's no way that we could make ends meet. And yet, for those of us who have tested him in this, we can speak to that there is more abundance in the 90% than in the hundred. And the math doesn't add up, but, but that's the nature of God's kingdom. Responding to Jesus in our need, it often requires us to take a step of faith. And maybe you're wondering, well, how do I do what Jesus says? Here's some questions that you can ask. Is there anything that God has asked you to do that you've been unwilling to do? Is there anything he's asked you to do that you've been unwilling to do? Or maybe has God asked you to do something that you've started but you've left undone? Or has you asked you to do something that you fully intend to do, but that you've delayed? Listen, partial obedience is not obedience. Delayed obedience is obstinance. Disobedience is defiance. God is not going to give you the next step until the step that he's given you has been taken. And so responding to Jesus, it requires putting your yes on the table. It says, Jesus, I don't know how this is going to play out. I don't understand this. This only makes sense in your kingdom, but I'm going to put my yes on the table. And that's when the ordinary becomes extraordinary. We see in verse nine that the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. There's a great application there that it's those who do what Jesus tells them to do that actually get to see behind the scenes. And then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone who brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after, the guests have already had too much to drink. But you, you have saved the best till now. Can you imagine the surprise? I mean, the servants <laughs> whispering to one another going, did that really just happen? And Jesus didn't just replenish the wine. He brought something even better. He took what was ordinary and made it extraordinary. He wasn't interested in just maintaining the status quo for them. What Jesus brought was something new, was something uh, even better. He saved the best for last. And he shows in this moment, he says, I am the true master of the banquet. In your need, whatever it is, you start by inviting Jesus in. You do what he says, but then ultimately, you receive what he gives. You receive what he gives. Now, listen, Jesus may not give you exactly what you want, but I can promise you, he is not bringing boxed wine to your party. <laughs> what Jesus gives, listen, what Jesus gives, he gives in abundance. In fact, in this case, what Jesus gave them, some scholars believe that this was equivalent to about 750 bottles of wine. He didn't just take care of them for the rest of their wedding. He set them up for the first year of marriage. Listen, if we can, if we can trust him with what he tells us to do, we can trust him with what we'll receive. God has your best intent at heart, your best interest at heart. When you invite Jesus into your need, when you do what he tells you to do, you will receive what you really need. But remember, this miracle is a sign. It's not just about the wine. We need to ask when we look at these signs, what is it that Jesus is pointing to? How is he trying to shift our focus? Remember, it's historical, but it's also theological. And so this sign doesn't just point to who Jesus is. Ultimately, it points to what Jesus came to do. Here's what I want us to do. Go back to verse 6. In verse 6, we see that nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now, here's what I want you to do in your Bible. I want you to circle the word six. Okay, there are six stone water jars. John specifically mentions this detail for us. And then next to that, I want you to write man. All throughout Scripture, the number six represents man. It represents human weakness. In fact, Scripture also uses the analogy of man being like an earthen vessel, like a jar. So what is he getting at? He's saying these six empty jars, they point to the human condition, that there is a need. 
that there is an emptiness that needs to be filled within us. Jesus is saying, you think the need is wine. You think the need is whatever it is, but there is a need that is much, much bigger. Apart from Christ, each and every one of us is empty. But what is also true is that we will try to fill the emptiness with something. It might be fame or influence. Some try to fill this emptiness with success, with possessions, with your net worth. Some try to fill it with family, with kids or their spouse or pets. Listen, if you have 29 cats, one more is not going to fix the problem. Some try to fill the, the emptiness with knowledge, with academic pedigrees. Some, like the crowd that Jesus was in, try to fill the emptiness with religion. In fact, we see in verse 6, these weren't just ordinary jars. No, they're ceremonial washing jars. What does that tell us? It tells us that this is about religion. What Jesus is saying is that the rituals and traditions, that religion and tradition, it cannot fill the emptiness. Doing all of the right things in the right way at just the right time, that's not the answer. Quite the contrary, actually. Religion only exasperates the emptiness we feel. It does nothing more than the empty jars did for the wedding party. But Jesus is saying, you need to be filled. You need to be made new. And that doesn't happen in religion. It happens in relationships. Jesus met their immediate need while pointing to their greater need. Listen, Jesus, he is interested in the everyday circumstances of your life, but he's not just interested in the everyday circumstances. What we see through this text is that ultimately Jesus' greatest concern is for our greatest need. And our greatest need is not another religion. It's something new. That's why he says that that he brings new wine. It's symbolic of the new covenant. All throughout scripture, wine represents joy. Joy is what Jesus brings. In fact, when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, he gives the disciples wine and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. No longer would people be required to uphold this sacrificial system. Jesus would become our sacrifice. That's what this sign is pointing to. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to bring a better covenant with better promises. He fulfills the Old Testament law that came before. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. He's saying this new covenant, the new wine I bring, doesn't fit in the old system. This is something that is new. He's saying, I am the answer to your greatest need. That he is the one who can fill us, who can make us right before God. He's the answer to the sin in our lives, the answer to the emptiness of humanity. And the good news is that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Scripture tells us the old life is gone and a new life has begun. Jesus, he's, Jesus is inviting you to invite him in. And if you've never trusted Jesus to be your savior, there is a new life. There is a better life that comes in Christ. What does he tell you to do? He says, trust in me, believe. And when we do what he gives, what we receive is salvation. We receive his spirit in us. We receive righteousness, a right standing before God. And there's still one more verse that I want us to see together. But if you've never believed in Jesus, if you've never fully trusted in him, I want to give you that opportunity to begin that journey today. So I'm going to invite all of us to bow our heads and close our eyes. And in a posture of prayer, if you've never received Jesus, to be your Lord and Savior. I want to lead you in a prayer to trust Him. And praying is just simply talking to God and and you're not going to pray alone. I'm going to lead you in this prayer one phrase at a time and you're going to hear men and women all across our campus praying alongside of you as an encouragement to you. But with your words, would you say, Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner, but today I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. Jesus, come into my life to be my Lord, my Savior, my forgiver. And in the best way that I know how, I turn my back on my sin and I give my life to you. Jesus, thank you for saving me. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And if you made that decision today, I wanna tell you congratulations. And I want you to not leave here today without filling out one of those decision cards. Let us know that you made a decision because we wanna come alongside of you in your next step. But John concludes this story by noting in verse 11, he says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples, would you say it? Believed. His disciples believed in him. After what the disciples experienced in this moment, they believed, they put their faith in Jesus, their confidence in Jesus. And this represents really a complete trust and reliance upon him. But it doesn't mean that they never experienced a need ever again. In fact, when we go through John's gospel and we look at the disciples, we see that their faith is tested time and time and time again. And the same is true for us. As believers in Jesus, if we have put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we will experience needs. We will be tested. And as I mentioned before, Jesus is not just interested in our everyday circumstances and needs, but make no mistake about it, He is interested in them. Your needs matter to Jesus. And so in your need, whatever it is that you're experiencing, go through this process. Invite Jesus in. Do what he tells you to do and receive what he gives. He doesn't just want us to do this for salvation. It's not just a once and done. That's not the goal of what this is about. This is a continual process in every arena of our life with every need that we have. And unfortunately, I think far too often in the Christian life, we believe the lies that the enemy will tell us that our need is too small. We believe the lie that what we're going through is, is insignificant, that Jesus doesn't have time, that Jesus wouldn't really care about. If this story tells us anything, it shows us he cares deeply. I mean, think about the needs that are represented at this wedding, the wedding party, this bride and groom, it, it, this was for their dignity. Mary had this need of, of validation. She needs to know my shame isn't in vain, right? And the servants that are there, they need an explanation. They're thinking, who is this guy? The disciples, they needed a demonstration. They've left everything to follow this rabbi. And they're going, is this, is this worth it? Is this the right call? And if you go back through the story, what you see is that Jesus is involved in each and every one of their needs. And so the question to ask is, well, what do they all have in common? Proximity, proximity to Jesus. And we can have that same proximity today. It comes through his word. It's not an accident that John begins his gospel saying that Jesus is the word. He's telling us, if you wanna invite Jesus in your need, seek him out. He's saying, if you wanna be filled with Christ, be filled with his word. You can't do what he says if you don't know what he says. And so in your need, search the word. Ask God to show you what to do and then receive what he gives. In fact, I think this is an incredible way to approach scripture. If you're going through the one year Bible plan and if you didn't start with us at the beginning of the year, you can still jump in wherever you're at, but go through this when you're reading. As you get to scripture, invite Jesus in. Say, Jesus, I want you to be a part. Illuminate your word to me. Help me to see through your spirit what it is that you're asking me to do. And then Jesus, would you empower me to do what you're actually telling me to do? Jesus, I want to receive what it is that you have to offer. What is the need in your life? And in that need, in your marriage, are you inviting Jesus in? In your job, in your work, in your schooling, are you doing what Jesus is saying and telling you to do in your parenting? With extended family, are you receiving the gift that Jesus wants to give? Jesus wants to fill you. He wants to be present in every need that you have, if you'll let him. God, we come before you today and we're so grateful that you give us your spirit, that when we trust in you, when we believe in you and we put our full life in your hands, God, that you fill us with your presence. And God, we thank you that you give us your word, which is living and active, that you give us guidance in how to go about our lives, honoring you and glorifying you, not just for, for our sake, but ultimately for your glory. And so God, would you empower us this week? 
Would you give us everything that we need to invite you in, to do what you say, and to receive what you give. And it's in the name of Jesus, the name above all other names that we pray these things. And everybody said, amen. You are dismissed. Don't miss next week for week two of Jesus is the Answer.